Yeah. Yeah, so John, you had asked about my high school and, and sending out pastors. And I think the, uh, the long answer to it is um, not all Missouri Synod high schools and, and, and elementary schools, I guess, are the same. You know, my, uh, my school, my primary school from kindergarten through eighth grade was physically attached to my church and my congregation and pretty much all of the students and all of the teachers um, were members of, of the same congregation. You know, kind of like the way it, way it used to be like at Westgate or, or St. John's in Fairbank back when they had a school. Um, and a lot of those um, have gone on to be, um, students from the school have gone on to be pastors or Lutheran school teachers or just good Lutheran families. Um, my high school was a little bit different. Uh, it was a Missouri Senate high school, uh, but it was an association school, uh, which meant that there were, there were several congregations that were feeding students into the school. Um, and uh, even while I was there, um, they opened up the association to non-Missouri Synod churches. Um, so there were other Lutheran churches and other non-Lutheran churches who were sending students there uh, so that although the school was Missouri Synod, the student body was not, right. you know, entirely. Right. Um, you know, but there were, there were a lot. Um, and there were some students who were Wells, so Wisconsin Synod. Um, but I would say the majority of the student body, uh, at least when I was there, um, in the Twin Cities at the time, uh, there was kind of an it church. Uh, and it was called North Heights. Uh, and North Heights started from a schism in my home congregation. Um, there was a schism, and people left the Missouri Synod Church, and they, they founded this kind of independent Lutheran church that became kind of, um, I don't want to say crazy, but they went off the rails on, on some, some topics, some particular topics. Uh, but they had a lot of worldly success and very big congregation. In fact, two congregations, very large, lots of kids. And so the, the student body population when I was there were, were Lutheran, but they weren't Missouri Synod. Um, so that's why out of 135, as far as I know, I'm the only Missouri Synod pastor. So... Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but I think uh, one of the things that's going on in Synod now, um, I think that we, we could be really good at, is uh, there's this new, I'm, Faith, Faith for watching this, she's going to laugh, because um, there's a new program going on in the Synod called um, Set Apart to Serve. Uh, you can read about in Lutheran Witness, the reporter, you know, it comes up on Facebook. Um, and basically what it means is uh, being more intentional as a congregation in encouraging children to consider church work. And, and adults, too. Um, you know, second career pastors or things like that. Of, you know, uh, part of how I ended up as a pastor and part of how, like, a lot of Lutheran school teachers ended up as teachers is somewhere along the line, Somebody or several buddies uh, at church said, "Hey, have you thought about this?" You know, uh, or or maybe um, uh, for a Sunday school session, uh, a Lutheran school teacher came in and talked about what what it's like to be a Lutheran school teacher, or or a DCE, or or a pastor came in and presented on, you know, what is it like to be a pastor? You know, um, that happened when I was a kid, and but we've kind of lost that, and so this initiative is. Uh, kind of tips in, in ways to um, encourage both children and adults to consider, you know, maybe the Lord has, has given you the gifts for, for service in the church. You know. Can I add to both of those? Mm -hmm. um, when you went to eighth grade, and then I went to fifth grade, but then when I went to school, we went to Sylvia, because Sylvia's a community mm -hmm. church. Uh, well, we ended up being a Synod organization. Yeah, when we went to that's fine. Yeah. Taking that no, Seward exists. Seward very, very much exists. Well, yes. for the kids that, like, night, night on up, for 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Do they take penny for this now over a year? Uh, so Karen's question is about um, you've you've noticed that over the last fifty years, um, the way of education in the synod has has changed. Um, you know, it used to be we had junior colleges and senior colleges. Um, so if you were to talk to like Rhoda and Larry. Um, they went to St. John's in Winfield, Kansas, which no longer exists. Um, president Saunders, our district president, was uh, part of the last class of, of that college, and that was primarily a teacher uh, college, and there were several other uh, teacher colleges throughout the Missouri Synod. But the, the system used to be um, of you had you know, your high school, um, and you had your, your junior college and, and your senior college. Um, and for pastors, you know, kind of the way it would look is um, if you were considering going into the pastoral ministry, um, already in eighth grade, um, your seminary had kind of already started. Um, and the way it looked was uh, basically ninth through, we'll say, 14th grade. You know, you would, you would do that in one place, and then you would go off to a senior college, and then at that point, you'd be given your, your bachelor's of divinity, and, and then go out into the parish. So my, my home pastor did that. Uh, pastor Moog's dad probably would have, would have done it exactly that way. Um, but what happened was uh, after World War II especially, um, the Missouri Synod Academia started to um, look really fondly at what was going on in Europe and how the European kind of colleges do this where you have a bachelor's degree and then you have a master's degree, um, you know, a four-year programs. And so we started incorporating that, um, as particularly into our seminary, right? Um, and so the changes have, have kind of happened over time. Uh, the, the net sum now is, you know, if you want to be a Lutheran school teacher, um, you get your, your bachelor's degree you know, in, in teaching whatever field that you're going to be doing. Uh, you could um, do it at a public university, uh, and then you would take, like, a colloquy program where you would get then certified as a Lutheran school teacher, um, which is kind of what a lot of our schools are doing now is finding Missouri Synod teachers who might not be certified Lutheran school teachers but then working on that. Um, or if you wanted to be a Lutheran school teacher, you could go to, like, Seward or or Mequon, or Concordia Chicago, or Concordia St. Paul, where they would bake that Lutheran school teacher certification into your degree program, um, which is really fantastic and, and, and a lot of fun. But Seward, yes, very much exists, um, as does Concordia Chicago, uh, Concordia Mequon, uh, Concordia St. Paul, uh, which is my alma mater, uh, Concordia Ann Arbor, uh, so in Michigan, uh, we have also Concordia in Irvine, California, so Southern California. Um, the ones that are now gone are Concordia in Selma, Alabama, uh, Concordia in Bronxville, New York, which closed last year, uh, and Pastor Ellingworth in Waverly was on the Board of Regents there, um, and then Concordia Portland uh, closed two or three years ago. Uh, so, so we're down from, and then uh, we have uh, Concordia, Texas, uh, but there's a, a sticky situation going on there, so uh, I'll leave that one for later. Uh, they, Austin? yes. Is that from the, from the leaders that said there's possible legal problems about that? Yes, and uh, as a lawyer, this isn't maybe the, the law that you practice, um, but what's going on with Concordia, Texas, is that they have altered their bylaws um, and they have dismissed all of the Synod elected Board of Regents and placed their own, um, which is in violation of their constitution and bylaws and synods as well. Um, and so that's actually in court right now. Um, and the issue is they, they want to be, but they don't want to have any oversight from the Synod. Um, and so that, that's problematic, and that's going on right now. In fact, it's in the civil court right now. So you may hear about that uh, coming up 
you know, as soon as the, the secular news finds out about it, you know, you're going to hear all sorts of bad things about the Missouri Synod. So sorry about that. Uh, but we should actually do some Bible study today. Uh, now that we've had a, had a long little lesson, uh, but the long story short is, uh, you know, if you want to go to school for church work, uh, whether you're young or old, do it. You know, consider it, pray about it. Uh, I could tell you the story of, I think, the oldest graduate of the Deaconess program at Fort Wayne. I think she was about 96 when she graduated. And she's still alive, and as far as I know, is still serving as a deaconess. And this was, this was like four years ago, you know. So she's one of those people that just has a, is a, able to live and function at 96 and, and is serving in a limited capacity because she's, you know, she's now like 100, uh, but she's still actively serving as a deaconess. Um, you know, I had classmates of mine uh, who, were, who did the alternate route program, uh, which means uh, it's a two-year program, and then you do your vicarage, and then, and then you, you're placed, your placement. Um, but it's for guys who, you know, have had first careers, you know, uh, but have decided that, you know, they, they want to serve the Lord uh, and the congregations as pastors. And so they, it's a two-year program, accelerated. And I've known a couple guys that have done that both in their 60s. You know, and they said, you know, we're going to go to seminary. You know, and the languages were hard, you know, but part of that was, you know, if you're a police officer for 25 years and then you go to seminary, you know, parts of your brain have, you know, have atrophied, like studying and things like that. So that, that was more hard than, than some other things. But uh, it's really something to, to consider, you know, especially now, like, um, you know, as our synod is, is kind of changing demographically, we have a lot of smaller congregations, you know, and in some, in some situations, smaller congregations that can't afford pastors. And those might be situations where uh, a gentleman from the congregation who's thought about being a pastor, you know, could do that, you know. Um, we have a program for that, too, of, of a, you know, they call it the SMP program, where a gentleman will, will have you know, his own vocation, but then will study to be a pastor on top of that, uh, and then, you know, serve as pastor of a congregation while also having, you know, say, a day job, uh, which is very tough, and it's not for everyone, but it's something to consider, so. But anyway, let's go ahead and have our opening prayer. Uh, does anybody remember what the gospel reading was on Sunday? The fifth commandment was involved with the, with the Old Testament reading, but it was involved in the, in the gospel reading. The gospel reading was from Luke chapter 10. It was a parable, one that we know well. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Right, We know that one uh, about how this, this man was going from Jerusalem down to Jericho and was half upon by... By robbers who stripped him, beat him, left him half dead. Uh, priest goes by, does nothing. Uh, Levite goes by, does nothing. Samaritan comes, has compassion, and, and helps him. Right? Uh, and this was Jesus' response to uh, a lawyer uh, who uh, put Jesus to the test uh, and then wanted to justify himself because Jesus put him in his place. Uh, so there's going to be some of that language uh, here, uh, and the interpretation of the parable, if you want to take it up a level, is uh, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, if we were to locate Jesus in the parable, who is Jesus? Which character in the parable is Jesus, and which character in the parable is us? Good Samaritan is, is, the, is the Jesus figure in the parable, and the, the man happened upon by robbers. You know, if we were to locate ourselves in the parable, we would find him there, or in the priest and the Levi who go by and do nothing, right? Uh, so you're going to hear some of that language here. This is the prayer for the 13th Sunday after Trinity. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you from our inmost heart that you have granted us to see this blessed time in which we hear the blessed doctrine of your gospel, and by it are able to know your will and fatherly heart 
and behold your Son, Jesus Christ. We beseech you of your boundless mercy graciously to sustain the blessed light of your word, and so to rule and direct us by your Holy Spirit, that we may never turn aside from it, but rather forsaking all things, cling firmly to it, and at last obtain salvation. To the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right, so we are continuing on in Lesson 6, and uh, John, I think you'll need one of these. Uh, we're on page 47, uh, I believe at the top. Uh, we're working our way through Revelation chapter 10. And we left off with this uh, detail about the scroll or the book. And what strange thing was John told to do with the scroll? Eat it. Take and eat it. Right? Um, and so we ended last week with that question. Right. In fact, that's where we're going today. Right? Uh, but we, we ended last week with this question of, of, of take and eat this scroll, right? And we decided that uh, in, in a way, this taking and eating, you know, when you eat something, something goes into your mouth and then it, and then it passes through your body and, and then it goes out. Uh, but what is that process called? Digesting. Yeah, digesting, right? And digesting is uh, when your body, I guess, extracts the nutrients uh, from the food, hopefully there is some, uh, and, and then takes what is useful, sends out the bad. Uh, and the idea of John taking and eating this scroll is kind of doing that with God's word. Uh, and we discussed last week how, you know, that's kind of what, what we do with the word, is we, uh, we hear it on Sunday, we, we think about it through the week, you know, and as we have occasion to, to speak about it or to apply it to the lives of ourselves and others, that's kind of how that process goes. Uh, and I think I, I mentioned, like, in the course of writing a sermon, you know, that's really what takes the most time for, for, for many pastors is, you know, working with a Bible text and then kind of digesting it and, and seeing how it applies in the lives of, of the congregation, right? Um, so that's what's symbolized here by this, this taking eating. But Doris had the question right away, uh, which is at the top of page 47. What is the significance of the scroll being both sweet and sour, right? And it has uh, some suggested passages here, uh, Let's see. Uh, Doris, uh, would you mind going to Psalm 119? And uh, Karen to Jeremiah 15? And then I'll go to Ezekiel. And we're going to find some, some similar language going on here. Uh, and Doris, whenever you have Psalm 119, verses one, verse 103. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Ah, very good. So how sweet are your words, David speaking to God. Uh, but then we have Jeremiah 15, verse 16. Oh, that's a nice verse from Jeremiah. I'll tell you about a different verse from Jeremiah in a second. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 3 says, uh, He said to me, Son of man, feed your belly with this scroll that I gave you and fill your stomach with it. Then I ate it, and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. Yeah, you're on the right track here, right? These are, yes, these are all describing God's word 
as sweet. Uh, but I'm thinking of in, in Jeremiah, you know, uh, where he goes to the temple, like God says, and says, you know, if you don't repent, this place will be like Shiloh. And then they want to kill Jeremiah, and he, he gets away. And then Jeremiah is upset with God because he's like, God, you told me to say this, and then I said it, and now everybody hates me. You know, and God's like, well, I knew that was going to happen. You know, um, where then the word, the same word, which is both sweet, is, is also at times uh, sour or, or, or bitter. Or uh, think of the, uh, the rich young ruler. How does that one go? He goes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, you know, and Jesus tells him and he says, well, I, I've done all that from, from my youth. Uh, and then Jesus looks at him and he says, you know, yeah, go, go sell your stuff, give it to the poor, uh, and come follow me. Yeah, or a, a similar passage. That would be yeah, uh, yeah, or a similar passage would be like ooh, Isaiah 6. You know, we hear this every Trinity Sunday where Isaiah has this vision of the throne room and, you know, uh, holy, holy, holy is Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his power or full of his glory. And then uh, God says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here am I, you know, send me. But then if you keep reading in this passage, God then says to Isaiah, this is Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. He said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy. And blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Right? Uh, so God is, uh, God already knows that the people are going to reject Isaiah's preaching, uh, so, but he sends them to do it anyway to draw out completely their, their evil. He says, I'm sending you Isaiah, I, they're not going to listen to you, but I'm sending you anyway so that their rejection of me can become apparent, right? Uh, and so in Isaiah's case, uh, who also preached very great gospel, uh, there's also in God's word the preaching of the law. Uh, and as sweet as the preaching of the gospel uh, is, uh, at times preaching the gospel, preaching the law, can be unpleasant. You know? uh, as parents... You know, and as grandparents, uh, you know, you understand this, uh, that sometimes you have to discipline the children, and nobody likes doing that. You know, I don't like having to discipline Gideon, you know, who, who likes doing that. But I also know the danger of not disciplining him. That's a problem of a different sort. Uh, but doing the discipline is not, not a whole lot of fun, you know. Uh, or as pastor... There are times where, uh, you know, I am called to preach the law, you know. In sermons, you know, typically, yeah, typically a sermon has both law and gospel, or it should have both law and gospel. Uh, but I mean, there are times in my pastoral care for, for a person where the healthy thing for them is to preach the law to them. And uh, almost universally... They don't like it, you know. Uh, like I said in my sermon on Sunday, we, we, we don't like to have the law preached. We don't like to have our sin addressed, even though that's the good thing for us, right? And so at times, and, and I've had this happen, and, I, and I, I will have it happen again, you know, where I've gone and I've preached the law to somebody, and they've hated me for it, you know. So then I have to leave, you know, and I was hoping for repentance and reconciliation, and, and now everything is just terrible. You know, I did my job, 
you know, hoping for a good outcome, there's a bad outcome, and that doesn't feel great, you know. Sometimes, yeah, right. You know, you can't you can't see that. You know, that's uh, that's good in the, the Martin Fransman hymn on the parable of the sower, where it goes, "Oh Lord, what of that?" and and and, and what of that? You know, we don't always see the outcome immediately. You know, um, so that's true. Sometimes there's an initial reaction uh, that that is bad that then over time softens and becomes something good. Sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes the the bad reaction persists. You know. Um, so sometimes it has a good outcome. Sometimes, in the immediate sense, it, it is a little bitter. You know, um, a time where there might be a good outcome would be uh, well when we faithfully practice close communion. You know, where somebody comes uh, and uh, they're not a member of our congregation or another Missouri Synod congregation or a congregation with whom we're in fellowship, uh, and I ask them, you know, not to commune. You know, I've had times where people have been really angry about that, uh, but then after time had considered, no, actually, you know, maybe that was the right thing. You know, I've also had people be really angry about that and never come back again. You know, that happens. But usually they were going to do that anyway. They were just looking for a reason. So it's probably hard to round this age with the hopes, you know, I'm afraid you're afraid, Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I think... There's a difference between you know, doing your job, doing my job in this case, and being mean about it. You know, um, and so like the times where I do ask somebody to refrain from communing, um, it's always followed with, uh, "Well, can I give you a blessing?" You know, um, or. Uh, John Sr. probably told you about his cousin who was here a few weeks ago uh, unexpectedly. And, you know, they're not Missouri Synod, and they, they said as much. I'm like, well, um, if you'd like to come forward, I, you know, for a blessing, that, that, would, that would still be fine, or you're welcome to stay back here and sing. That's great, too, you know. Uh, we're trying to both practice faithfully, but also uh, not be a jerk about it. Pardon my French. You know, and sometimes that part is what goes wrong, you know, uh, where a pastor can express something that is true and right, uh, but maybe in a way that could be improved, you know, um, and that's an art, you know. F te telling somebody uh, that they uh, should not commune here, you know, at the now, uh, in a way that they're going to receive that, that's an art, you know, and there's been times where I have not done that correctly, <laughs> you know, I've not threaded that needle, um, so... Yeah, what? I don't know. We're the Missouri Synod, and there's enough of us here in Iowa that this isn't like a totally out of the world concept, you know. So we have that advantage of being here in Iowa. Of, you know, there are Missouri Synod congregations around, and this is, you know, not unheard of that you might not be able to commune at a Missouri Synod congregation. Um, in North Dakota, where the ELCA outnumbered us like eight to one, you know, that was a different story. You know, where the Missouri Synod churches were few and far between, and the ELCA churches were everywhere. Um, and so they would come to our congregations and expect to commune. Uh, and any time I or another pastor didn't, it was a big problem. You know, uh, so we have that advantage. So that's very hard. So the same preaching of God's word, uh, preaching of the gospel, is great and very sweet, but at times preaching the law uh, can, can be hard. You know, and, and so that's where we're getting here, this, this scroll that is, is sweet in the mouth and, and, and sour you know, in, in the stomach, this, this preaching of, of the law and the gospel, right? Uh, but as in the fire is fast, too? How do you pronounce it? Preuss. Yeah. Preuss. Yes. Okay. Clement Preuss. Yeah, P-R-E-U-S. It's, it's, it's yeah. you know, right. Right. You know, and there are times where preaching the law uh, can, you know, feel good, I guess. Like, uh, Doris, you read Psalm 119, you know, which is all about how David uh, loves God's word and in including the law. And oftentimes in the Psalms, David will talk of 
you know, I don't sit with evildoers. I, I don't pour out their drink offerings of blood. I, I don't uh, associate with those people because that is wrong and against God's word. Like, that's a preaching of the law even to yourself, uh, maybe in a, in a way that can be good, you know, of like, I do not associate with those people, you know, which is, you know, then to pull into modern mindset that's totally foreign to how our, our modern, you know, mindset works, you know, but uh, what does St. Paul say? You know, he's quoting some philosopher, but he, you know, uh, bad company corrupts good morals, right? You know, and, that, and that's true in 2023 as well of, you know, you know, if you surround yourself with people who don't believe God's word, you better be careful because pretty soon that'll come for you, right? Uh, so sometimes, you know, saying, you know, preaching the law can be a, a, a good thing. You know, uh, or I was at a baptism a couple weeks ago, and the pastor did a little sermon on uh, on infant baptism and how churches that refuse to baptize infants um, are disobeying God's word and, and doubting Christ, and uh, you know, which was a preaching of the law. And I was like, that's right. You know, they, they don't baptize babies. They're, they, they don't do that because they don't believe in baptism. You know, that, that's bad, you know. Uh, so in that case, that was a preaching of the law, but, you know, it wasn't bitter because it was correct, right? Uh, but sometimes it can be. So that's the sweet and the sour. Uh, the, the scroll that John consumes and digests, he is to preach. Uh, and at times it is going to be sweet and, and, and great like honey, and at times, it's going to be, be sour and, and difficult, you know, as preaching law and gospel can and, and is, right? Uh, now, the question here, then, is, according to verse 7, it says the, uh, that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be, be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Uh, so John is told to, to eat this uh, and then go preach uh, in an urgent sense. Um, now, why is this mission so urgent? When's Christ going to return? We don't know, but soon, right? Uh, so, in the scheme of things, should we assume that we have lots of time yeah. or that we have little time? Never know. Maybe we have more. Right. Uh, so, uh, John and his mission, and, and perhaps us in our mission as the church, you know, should be making wise use of the time uh, because the days are short. You know, we don't have unlimited time. You know, the return of Christ is coming. We don't know when it will be, so we should act like that, right? Uh, in our evangelizing, in our care for each other, in the care for, for the community, you know. Uh, but we sometimes have the problem of procrastination, you know. And I'm a procrastinator by nature, you know. Why, why do today what you can do tomorrow, you know? Uh, and sometimes we do that as a church, and that can be problematic, you know, in several ways, uh, in, 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 so, in one way because we're neglecting to use the time that we've been given, right? right? And that's something that we all learn as parents, too, like, uh, especially, like, and this is something I'm trying always to be better about, you know, but these devices and the big ones, like, I always look when we go out to eat as a family, you know, go to Chick-fil-A or, or wherever, and you look around and how many families are there whose children are plugged into this at the table, you know? And not just parents. I've seen grandparents do this who should know better. Uh, but I think about that. And how is that? That's a missed opportunity. You know, when you're out for, for a meal with your family, that is an opportunity. And you're squandering it by plugging them in, right? Uh, and maybe some people agree, disagree with me and say that's a totally fine and fair use of your time. 
I, I say I only have 18 years or less, you know, why, why would I want to spend it doing that? You know, 15 with Gideon. He's already at preschool right now. So what happened? Yeah, what happened? You only, you only get that, that little time. And, well, it's the same for us as a church. We, we only have so much time. We might as well use it, right? Okay. Now, according to Matthew 24, it says... What will happen before the end of this age? Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, Martin Luther and uh, and then Dr. Gibbs, who writes the commentary on Matthew, who was retired now, but seminary professor at St. Louis, um, they make a good uh, argument for um, when Jesus is talking about the gospel going out into the whole world, um, he's talking about the gospel being written down. Um, that uh, that's exactly what he tells the apostles at the end of Mark. He says, "Go out into the whole world and preach to the whole creation." Right? Uh, that he's foreshadowing the the writing of the gospel and the spreading of it throughout throughout the world, um, as opposed to like how evangelicals would interpret that text, where they'd say, "Well, before Christ can return, every single individual person has to make their decision for Christ or against Christ, and and then Jesus can come back." And that's problematic for for a few reasons. Uh, instead of saying, well, uh, before Christ returns, uh, the news of his life, death, and resurrection is going to go out into the whole creation, and, and it has. You know? um, there's still more work to do. You know, there's, there's isolated languages that uh, Bible societies around the world are, are working with. Lutheran Bible Translators is one that, that we support as a, as a church body and as a district. Um, there's all sorts of different Bible societies that are actively working on translating into these, these languages that still don't have the Bible, uh, but otherwise, I mean, it's out there. I mean, type on, go to the app store on your phone and type in Bible and look at how many apps you have. Um, Lutheran Hour of Ministries, you know, does, has radio stations around the world, you know, in, in faraway places where they, they broadcast for thousands of miles, you know, and people will be in the middle of Mongolia, and, and they'll hear the Lutheran hour, you know, you know and become Christians over, over time. You know, it's like, that's wild. Uh, but th- that happens, right? Uh, so uh, another clue then that the time is short. You know, the gospel has gone out into the world. It is continuing to go out into the world, and that means that we don't have much time left. Uh, And so this last question under this section says, what opportunities do you have today to fulfill your part in this mission of God's people? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we have, I mean, there are full-on unbelievers. Um, there's also plenty of people who uh, have lapsed in the faith, you know, and, and that's probably a field of, of service too, of, you know, trying to invite them back uh, and, and, and plug them back in, I guess, of, you know, their first love. You know, I think that's, that's an area um, that we could, both of those are areas that we can improve in. On the one, people who are straight up unchurched, uh, you know, unbelievers, uh, but then also people who are, are lapsed. And I would say that there's, there's a lot of that here, and a lot of that in Fairbank, you know, is what I found. Um, a lot of people who are familiar with, with Jesus and you know, going to church, but don't now, and, you know, kind of talking about, well, well why, why is that, you know? 
Um, and sometimes it involves then preaching the law and the gospel to them. You know, sometimes it's why don't they go? Well, uh, stuff gets in the way. Sports usually, and the river, and sometimes the job. You know, I work on Sunday mornings. Well, is there, you know, do you have to work on Sunday mornings? There are, you know, 164 other hours in the week, you know, uh, things like that, where, no, when it comes down to it, you choose to work on Sunday morning. You know, nobody, nobody has to, you know, I guess unless you're in the Army and you're, you know, you have to. Mm-hmm. And in their case, tax paper actually Yeah. But I mean, the stores just weren't open. Right, yeah, blue laws. Everybody yep. went to town on Saturday night and did their grocery shopping and, and listened to the band play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was our Saturday night thing, you know, Sunday morning, everybody went to church. Yeah, I grew up with that too because, uh, you know, we like to spend a lot of time at the hobby shop, you know, look at model cars and trains and. Yeah. And uh, we would do that Sunday afternoons because they weren't open. You know, in that case, I don't think it was open till like three o'clock on Sunday, and then it was only open for like three to four thirty or something like that. You know, and even when I was in North Dakota, um, even in Fargo, uh, Target did not open until like noon on Sundays. That has since been struck down. Thanks, people of Fargo. Uh, but you know, even for the first couple of years of my being a pastor, yeah, you couldn't go to go to Target or Walmart in Fargo because, you know, of that. And I thought that was really interesting, you know. But, yeah, um, the time is, is short. And so what does that look like in our lives? Well, uh, act like it, you know, uh, when you have opportunities to, to speak about Christ, uh, to encourage people with the hope that we have in him, you know, do it. Uh, when you have the opportunity to invite somebody to church, you know, don't wait until next week. You know, I think the average person to go from not going to church to giving it a shot, it takes being asked eight times. And that's the statistic, statistic I think, from the Barnum Group where they've done this, where they've done a big poll of like 1,000 people who didn't go to church, who now go to church because they were invited. And how many times did somebody have to invite you before you finally went? And it's like eight times, you know. Yeah. Just do it eight times. Yeah, 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 and that, that's what it what it takes, you know, and uh, and you know, and then the, then the scary one is uh, how how many Sundays does a person have to miss before they start sliding into you know lapsing from church? It's three. Statistically, it's three. If somebody misses three three Sundays in a row. That's that's kind of the tipping point. And then you feel guilty because you don't go. Right. Or you discover you like not going to church because look at what it frees you up to do. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. So, anyway, that's a topic for another day. But uh, what can we do? Make use of the time. Talk to people, invite them to church, uh, help people, you know, uh, live like a Christian. That's, you know, these are, I guess these are all kind of law things, but, you know, it's third use of the law. You know, we're, we're Christians, and now this is how we act as Christians, right? Uh, and obviously then for the benefit of our neighbor. Like, when you invite somebody to church, it's not to toot your own horn, it's seeking their benefit, right? That's, that's the whole point of doing all this. It's, it's not to benefit ourselves, uh, but to help our neighbor, right? Uh, let's keep going says, oh, this is connected, uh, reflect on your experiences in confessing your faith before other people. What incidences can you recall when speaking of your faith was easy? Or when was it difficult? When, if ever, did you meet with outright hostility? Hmm. Probably the easiest is at church, you know, or maybe at home. Well, maybe not at home. Uh, when is it difficult to talk about your faith?
Yeah. Because she was buying uh, a lot of these portraits for me in mm. Broadway, and I didn't really know how, but I just got money and just mm. used to use it. So we didn't have to worry about what we were going to say. It was just right. off the wall, and we were yep. friends, and you could put the words in your mouth. Yeah. 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 Sometimes uh, I, you know, I've gotten that a few times, like particularly old men uh, that I'll, I'll, you know, they they don't come to church, so I'll go visit them, and then uh, then they usually it's some variation of uh, going to church isn't for me, and then then I'll ask, well, wh- what do you mean by that? You know. Uh, because are you just trying to be nice to me and tell me that you don't believe in Jesus, or you know what? Wh- what do you mean by church isn't is going to church isn't for you, right? Uh, and then they usually have no response to that. But so I assume it's the first is they're just trying to be nice and they don't want to outright say they don't believe in Jesus. It's easier to just say I don't feel like going to church, right? Uh, so those can be hard situations. Yeah, you know, and then you add in the fact that somebody's dying, you know. Uh, it, it can be really hard, yeah. Especially if there's a history there of, you know, this person maybe isn't antagonistic, uh, but they're not really interested in hearing about, you know, Jesus. And that, that can be hard, you know. Not hostile, but but hard. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's you know time. You know, sometimes you have to choose your opportunity. You know, and then there's an art to that too, of you know seizing the moment. You know, and it means recognizing the time. You know, when is the time? What isn't the time? That, that's that's hard. You know. Um, you know, I think of Jesus. You know, at. Uh, the synagogue in Nazareth, you know, when he read from the scroll of Isaiah and then said, you know, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, you know, he had to have, well, he obviously knew what was going to happen, uh, but then he did it anyway, you know, and of course was they tried to kill him, but, you know, so I guess that counts as hostility, you know, and then there have been times where maybe you've, you've been met with that, I mean, uh, I guess the only times I've ever been met with, met with hostility uh, when talking about the faith has been with my own members, you know, lapsed members. You know, I, I've never been like, if I'm talking to somebody who's not a Christian, like say in Fairbank or you know, from time to time here, um, there's not usually hostility. You know, same I would say, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not a believer and you know, I'm not really interested in that, you know. And, you know, very, very pleasant. I mean, whenever, whenever I've, Encounter that situation where somebody's not a believer and they're not really interested. Usually they're okay about it. Maybe like, maybe if we were in the cities, they'd they'd shout at me. Some some lady with uh, orange hair would yell at me or something. Uh, I was reading a study yesterday that half of American college students think that it's acceptable to shout somebody down if you disagree with what they're saying. And I'm just like, that's scary. Uh, that, that if you don't like what you're hearing, you can just shout at somebody until they go away. Uh, like, you know. <laughs> it it kind of is, yes. Uh, but the only time I've ever encountered like hostility, like we want you to leave this space now, uh, has been with my own members, you know, who don't want to hear God's word. You know, that that and then it gets really hard. You know, so that's 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 really hard. You know, uh, so speaking of hostility, though, uh, we're going to turn to chapter eleven. Uh, and it says, the, visions of, the vision of the two witnesses, Revelation 11, was given to encourage you especially when you meet with ridicule, hostility, and persecution as you profess your faith and life in Christ. So it has us read Revelation 11, verses 1 through 6. That's what I found. Oh, Okay. Thanks, Siri. Then I was given a measuring rod, like a staff, 
And I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out. For it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant authority to to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. It says, John was commanded to measure the temple. This alludes to a vision Ezekiel had 14 years after the destruction of Solomon's temple. In that vision, the prophet watched as a man measured the heavenly temple and the glory of the Lord returned. Ezekiel was to relay his vision to his fellow exiles to comfort them with the knowledge that God would rebuild his temple. Because this was an ideal temple, Ezekiel's vision was no doubt a prophecy not only of the rebuilding of the physical temple, but of the building of the Christian church as well. The temple in John's vision represents the true church, that is, all believers. The measuring of the temple indicates that these believers will be protected by God, even as he permits unbelievers to have some power to attack the church. This will occur throughout the New Testament era. Although the saints will suffer and even be killed, They will not lose their faith or perish in unbelief. However, the outer court was not to be measured. This represents either the unbelieving pagan world or possibly believers who compromise their faith. The 42 months represent the gospel age, the period of time from Christ's ministry on earth to the last day, uh, 42 months times 30 days per month, Uh, 1,260 days. So we're looking with, uh, in the Bible, we work with uh, a lunar calendar, not a solar calendar. So months are 30 days uh, or three and a half years. This will be a period not only of gospel proclamation, but also of affliction. This time span symbolizes a limited period of time during which evil is allowed free reign. So let's Let's pause here and and recap what we have just read. So John is in this vision. He's given this this measuring rod, and he's told to go and and measure the temple, uh, but only part of it, the the inner part of the temple, but not this outer courtyard. Uh, And God says uh, that the the outer courtyard is given over to the nations who are going to trample on it, for 42 months, so time, times, and half a time, or 1,260 days, that for a limited period of time, although God will protect his church, uh, it will still face uh, affliction. And uh, Dr. Brighton, who wrote the commentary on this, um, he suggests that um, although God will preserve his church, he doesn't always preserve our buildings. Or think of like when COVID hit and how many worship services were disrupted. The church continued. You know, we, we remained in the faith. We were able to make use of technology as appropriate. Uh, but our worship life for a time was, was disrupted. You know, it has returned. You know, or think of Christians in um, Pakistan or Southeast Asia where... Uh, being a Christian is either illegal or very dangerous. You know, China, for example, right? Uh, you can be a Christian in China if you, you know, if you believe within the state-sanctioned uh, Christendom, which, you know, doesn't talk about Jesus. It talks about, like, Mao Zedong and things like that, and they have pictures of Xi Jinping up on, on their altar and stuff like that. Um, that's different, but the true Christians in China, uh, for the most part, have to worship in secret. 
you know, and they're always under danger from secret police infiltrating their congregation and sending them all to prison, right? Uh, so although God preserves them in the faith, uh, outwardly the worship life of Christian congregations is at times disruptive. You know, so that's what Dr. Brighton suggests, is that uh, although the church will continue uh, for this period of time between Christ's ascension and his return, uh, there will be periods where outwardly the, the life of the church is disrupted. Um, if you think of, uh, we have two partner churches in Russia, one based in Siberia, in Novosibirsk, where we have a seminary, um, and one based in St. Petersburg, where we also have a seminary. Uh, but during the Soviet Union, all those Lutheran churches were taken away. Their pastors were sent to prison in the gulags, uh, and their churches were turned into movie theaters and swimming pools, or in some cases just left destitute. Um, and now still, particularly the church in St. Petersburg, um, they are starting to get these churches back. There's, there's all sorts of applications that they fill out and send to the Russian government and get these churches back, and they're starting to kind of repair them. Like, this was our family church for 180 years, and then the Soviets came, and now it's literally falling apart, but at least we have it back, you know, and so things are starting to start back up. But for that time, although the church continued, outwardly there was this great disruption, right? Um, and so that's what Dr. Brighton suggests is going on in here in this vision. But the one thing we're going to pick up next week then are these witnesses, these two witnesses. And we heard some description of them about how they're going to, to preach, uh, how they have some uh, certain authority here. Uh, we're going to talk next week about what's the deal with those witnesses, uh, maybe who are they, and in particular then, uh, who do they represent? Uh, so we're going to put a pause in here because we're just over time by one minute. Take that. Richard's not here. If he were, he'd be leaving, I guess. <laughs> but we'll put a pause in it. So we're on page 47, uh, and we still have a a chunk to go in chapter 11, so we'll, we'll give it a shot. But at the end of our Bible study, this lesson talks about the rapture, so maybe we'll, we'll read that one at the end uh, and see, see what we think about that. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and uh, put a pause on it, uh, and we'll end with prayer. Let us pray. Uh, gracious Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you on this day for the opportunity to to be here and to continue our study of your word. Uh, we thank and praise you for all the good that you have done for us, uh, including a, a great sacrifice to yourself, securing for us forgiveness and, et and eternal salvation. Uh, we confess gladly that from the right hand of the Father, you rule over all things for our benefit, uh, although at times, from our perspective, uh, that's not always what we see, uh, that although we are preserved in the faith, we are at times faced with uh, affliction, with persecution, with hostility. And we ask, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, you would help us to see past these things, uh, that whatever you uh, place in our path is for our good, that uh, through it you are working to, to refine us and to strengthen us. We ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would also uh, grant us grace to recognize the time, uh, that when we have opportunities to show love to our neighbor, uh, to speak of your love, uh, that we would do so. And by your same Holy Spirit, uh, grant that those seeds would take root in the hearts of those who hear and receive them. Let your blessing remain with us through the remainder of this day. Grant that we would be kept in peace and safety so that we might return here again on Sunday. In your name we pray.